Hello, and welcome to OPW's continuing series of instructional videos on retail gas station equipment. You may have already viewed the initial series of 101 videos where we showed you an introductory high-level overview of how a retail gas station operates along with the types of equipment typically installed at one of the facilities. We also covered some of the terminology and acronyms used in the petroleum world. If you are new to the petroleum industry and are watching this video, you may want to go back and start with the Retail 101 videos. So, if you sat through the 101 series of videos, you know my name is Ed Kammerer and I'm the Global Director of Product Management here at OPW. OPW is the world's largest manufacturer of petroleum handling equipment in the world. Our job is to keep critical fluids from entering our ground, water, and air and providing a safe refueling experience for our customers and the environment. In the 201 series of videos, we will get more in depth and talk about each product group specifically along with some technical information. So today, we're gonna to focus on what is called overspill or overfill protection. This type of equipment is commonly referred to as spill containers or as we like to call them, spill buckets. So why do we have spill buckets? Back in the late 70s and early 80s, oil companies and refineries began using a chemical called MTBE, or methyl tertiary butyl ether. This was blended in the gasoline to help oxygenate the fuel and was used to replace lead as an octane enhancer. So what happened was people became concerned with lead in things like paint and gasoline. So this began the switch from leaded to unleaded fuel and MTBE was used to accomplish this. The problem was, it was not realized at this time, was MTBE actually absorbs into water. And by the late 80s, there began to be a report of levels of MTBE being found in drinking water. It was also later determined MTBE was a potential carcinogen. So when the EPA began investigating, they realized the MTBE was entering groundwater from gasoline contamination. When gasoline was introduced into the ground, the fuel remained separated from the water, but the MTB was absorbed into groundwater. Therefore, they began investigating leaking underground tank systems, and what they found was most of the fuel being introduced into the ground was not coming from leaking tanks, but from the point where the tanks were being filled. In the early days, there was simply a four inch riser pipe coming up from the tank through the ground, surrounded by an open manhole which contained the adapter the fuel delivery truck would hook up to. Any drips, leaks, or if the driver overfilled the tank slightly, would simply drain down into the backfill and into the ground surrounding the tank. Over time, this can, could accumulate and become a large volume of gasoline being introduced into the ground. Therefore, in 1988, the federal EPA passed a law that would require all USTs, underground storage tanks, to have three things. They needed overspill protection, which are spill buckets, overspill prevention, or overfill valves, and also overspill detection or tank monitoring. All existing USTs had 10 years to comply by September of 1998. So here we are some 25 years later after we began installing spill buckets in the ground and what's happened is over those 25 years many of these spill containers have began to crack and uh, are now once again leaking gasoline into the ground around these underground storage tanks and basically preventing from what they were designed to do in the first place and that's keep gasoline out of the ground. So now the next generation of EPA regulations that were just released in July of 2015 uh, Spill buckets are still required, but now for the first time we have to go back and test these spill containers. Uh, they need to be inspected monthly and then tested every three years. Okay, so now let's talk about the different types of spill buckets. Like a lot of things in life, they come in different sizes and shapes. Uh, let's take capacity or volume, for instance. The most common spill bucket holds about five gallons of, of liquid, uh, but they also can come in up to 15 and 25 gallons. So the reason why some people would like to go to a 15 gallon bucket is if you remember in our Retail 101 videos, the drop hose, which is the hose that goes from the tanker truck that we connect into our bucket to fill our tank, um, it, it, the, the volume that's in that hose itself is a little over seven gallons. So if for some reason you needed to shut off or the tank became full and you need to drain the product that's left in that hose, some people feel that a five gallon bucket won't be quite enough to hold all that product. So they upgrade to a 15 gallon to make sure that there's enough space in the bucket to hold the product that's still in the hose. So uh, another thing that is different or options that come with the spill container is how it's actually attached to the four inch riser pipe that comes up from the top of the tank. The most common method to mount a spill container is to thread it onto the riser. Uh, the riser has a four inch 
uh, male thread, and then the base of the bucket is the four inch female thread, and it's simply uh, pipe doped and, and, and threaded on. Uh, the other method is they're simply s uh, a slip on, where the bucket slid down the riser to a certain depth, and then it's clamped down. The problem with slip on buckets is sometimes over time they, they make or could potentially leak. So we see more people going to thread on buckets than slip on buckets. And actually, there's many states throughout the US that don't even allow slip on buckets. But it is an option if someone's looking to save some costs when they're uh, uh, buying a new spill container. The other feature that differs slightly on the spill containers is the lid and how it seals on top of the ring of the spill bucket. These, uh, these spill containers can either be rain tight, which is basically the lid has a gasket or a seal inside the lid and the weight of the lid provides a sealing surface or the sealing force to basically keep off um, you know, rain or slight water that may come across the forecourt. However, uh, they also make spill containers with a, a watertight lid where we use a, a bigger seal or kind of what's referred to as a plumber's plug where the handle sits in the ring, we bring the handle down, it expands the, the, the wide gasket against the inside of the, um, the ring and provides a tighter seal. People will use these in areas that get heavy rainfall or they uh, um, prone to flooding or, or a lot of water comes across the uh, forecourt and they want to keep the water out of the spill containers. The, um, the other thing that you notice is the, the ring on the bucket. So when this tank is set and it's in the ground, we usually the, the concrete will be poured right to the bottom of this ring and then you see these ramps and what those are designed to do is when you have snow on the forecourt and as a snow plow comes across, the ramp adds or aids and keeps the ring or the, uh, the cover from being taken away with the snow plow. So we, we call these uh, snow plow rings, these, uh, these angled ramps here on the bucket. Some buckets though, we designed, they're uh, poured right at grade. This example, the, the, the slant is actually built in the cover, so we don't have the, the ring being raised above the uh, level of the concrete. It's poured flush, but again, still have the ability to keep the lid from being taken away with the snow plow. So in the early days, the way spill buckets were designed and installed was they were uh, what we call a direct berry or a single wall bucket. So this bucket would be threaded on top of the riser, backfill would be placed around the tank, and then concrete would be poured. The problem with this design is if I ever needed to replace this bucket over time, if, if uh, it was cracked or began leaking, and I had to replace this bucket, it was basically cemented into the ground. So in order to pull it out or replace it, I would have to come to the site with a large concrete saw, cut out around the bucket, and then get a backhoe and, and dig out from around and pull the bucket off the riser and replace it that way. So as we began testing buckets uh, recently here, uh, the idea came about where to make a bucket that could be replaced without having to dig it out. So we still make a single wall bucket, but it's actually a, a retractable style bucket now, where there's, uh, the primary bucket is here, and then there's provided a, a backfill guard that surrounds it. So now, with the retractable single wall bucket, if I ever had to replace the bucket here, I would simply take the bolts out from the top of the ring and then bolts down at the bottom below the bellows and the whole bucket can be pulled up through this guard and replaced with a new bucket without having to, to cut up or break concrete. Now along with uh, you know, another development in spill buckets in the, in the recent future is rather than just having a single wall bucket, you know, we talked about piping and the underground storage tanks having double wall. Basically the idea is if the primary layer or the primary bucket failed, there's some type of, of layer or secondary containment to collect any gasoline if that primary surface or, or containment chamber should fail. So now manufacturers make lines of double wall spill containers. So basically it's a, a primary spill bucket inside of another spill bucket and then we also put the uh, protective gravel guard around here so this bucket can actually be the primary bucket can be replaced or the secondary bucket can be replaced. So uh, that's the big advantage of the newer style buckets is as we begin testing these buckets and then they fail which will probably have a lot of the buckets that have been installed for 25 some years um, once these are tested they're probably going to have to uh, be replaced so there'll be a lot of spill buckets dug out of the ground. So the hopes is now as the next generation of spill buckets go in they'll be retractable, replaceable 
or a double wall bucket so they can be easily replaced in the future. So you know from the Retail 101 videos that the way we get the product from the, from the truck into the tank is through this, uh, what we call a fill adapter. The driver will hook his elbow up to this tight fill adapter and he'll begin dropping product in the tank. So when he's done, when he pulls the adapter off, you know, what'll happen is some of the residual product that's left in the hose will drip down in a spill container, which is exactly what the spill container is designed to do is to collect that, that gasoline or that fluid rather than going down in the ground. So now that I have the gasoline in the bottom of the bucket, what do I do it f with it from there? Well, there's two different things or, or two different styles of spill buckets uh, when it comes to eliminating the product that's found in the bottom of the bucket. Uh, one way is we do with a drain valve. So this is a, a, a tight valve, but when I pull up on the chain, it opens up the valve, and now any gasoline or liquid that's in the bucket will flow down into the uh, drop tube and, and back down in the tank. The one problem with this, however, is not only sometimes is gasoline in the bucket, but if I have a heavy rain or if the lid was missing or for some reason I get water inside the bucket as well, I really don't want to be draining water down into my tank. So the other option for these spill buckets is to simply have a plug where this valve would be. So then what would happen as I get gasoline and water in the bucket, I would get a small hand pump, I would pump that liquid out, and then it would have to be disposed of uh, properly because it is a hazardous fluid now. So that's the other uh, differences between buckets. They can come with what we call drains or plugs. Okay, so we talked about earlier in the video that the EPA is now going to require these spill buckets to be tested every three years. So the question is, how do you test a spill bucket? Well, the original way to test a spill bucket, and this goes back to the days of the single wall spill container, is what's referred to as a hydrostatic test. It's a pretty simple test. Basically, you'll fill the bucket up with water, you'll mark the level of that water, and then you let it sit. And as long as that water level hasn't dropped more than an eighth of an inch within an hour, then that spill bucket passed. You know there's no leaks anywhere in the bucket. The problem with this test is, number one, I had to wait an hour to see if the liquid level dropped, and now I've got five gallons of water that is now contaminated because there's probably been some type of, of gasoline in this bucket at one point or the other. So now I have five gallons of contaminated liquid that I now have to dispose of properly. Okay, so one of the other advantages of installing a double wall spill bucket is not only do you have the ability to retract that primary bucket if ever it needs to be replaced, but the other advantage is when it comes to testing. Because I have a primary bucket and a secondary bucket, I have this interstitial space, and I can now use that interstitial space to perform my test on the bucket. So rather, in, instead of filling the bucket up with water, I can now get a simple hand pump or hand vacuum. On this particular model, there's a built-in test port or a, a, um, an air gauge there in the bucket that I can attach my gauge to, take my pump, and I can pull a vacuum. Uh, because it's a small measure of a vacuum, we measure these in inches of water column. Uh, just for reference, there's about 26 inches of, of uh, water column in one PSI. So we're talking about you know, real small increments of, of pressure or vacuum here. So with this test, I simply need to pull 15 inches of vacuum, let that sit for one minute, and as long as my vacuum doesn't drop below 12 inches after one minute, I know that my bucket is tight and I can go on and check this as a, as a, uh, a pass for my spill bucket contest. So I'll go on and do the next one. I don't have to mess uh, with draining the bucket or, or pumping water out of the bucket that's been contaminated with fuel. Um, I did it quick. I did it easy. So a huge advantage with a double wall spill bucket when it comes to testing of spill containers. Okay, so there is one other way to test spill buckets, and again, this would only be accomplished is if you have a double wall spill container. And this is actually a way that we can continuously monitor or continu continuously test the integrity of our spill container. And we do that by using a, a, a liquid sensor, similar to the same sensors that you may find inside uh, tank sumps and containment sumps. So the, the float sensor, the liquid sensor, would be placed in the bottom of the secondary bucket and then if liquid is detected by the float, it's wired back to the tank gauge and it'll send an alarm telling someone that there's liquid in this space. Now the liquid could have come from the primary, uh, a, a leak or a failure in the primary bucket, or perhaps it's water coming in from a breach in the secondary bucket. But either way, it's a way of continuously monitoring the integrity of the spill container. And if the bucket is continuously monitored and inspected, 
um, once a month, the EPA now says that if you inspect and record that this bucket has been inspected once a month, you no longer have to test it every three years. In addition to the electronic sensor, uh, this particular edge bucket here and many of the other double wall spill buckers, buckets also have a visual gauge uh, that with a, a float, again, that's down in the interstitial space and it's uh, just simply look down in the bucket, you see a gauge and it will tell you whether there's liquid present in the double wall uh, space of the bucket. Now it's not a sensor where it would electronically send an alarm back to a, a, a console or a, 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 a gauge or a, um, a tank monitoring system, but it's just a simple visual gauge to let you know whether there's liquid inside that interstitial space or not. So I hope you've enjoyed this 201 level of our OPW retail gas station videos. Today we talked about overspill protection. Stay tuned, we've also done videos on overspill prevention and then also overspill monitoring. I'm Ed Kammerer, thank you very much for watching.